I want to speak to you this morning upon a very solemn subject. We might entitle our message this morning, The Religion of Hell, or The Faith of Devils, or Demon Faith. James chapter 2, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. This is a remarkable statement by the Apostle James. We have said last Lord's Day that in this second chapter of the epistle of James, James is combating the easy believism of his day. He's showing us that true saving faith is more than just a mental assent to certain truths. James is teaching us in this second chapter, and he's going at great lengths to do it, that true saving faith results in a change of life. It results in a life of love to Christ, a life of obedience to God. True saving faith recognizes the lordship of Christ in the lives of of his people. The Savior said that except you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, then ye cannot be my disciple. James is exposing the heresy and danger of what we learned about last Lord's Day, antinomianism. There are those that profess that whenever you're a, a Christian, that the law of God has got absolutely nothing to do with the Christian life. And yet the Apostle Paul said, do we make void the law? He says, no, we establish the law. The law of God becomes our rule of faith and practice. And James is emphasizing here that faith ought to lead to works, service, and obedience. And while we are not saved by works, the Scripture is very clear that we are saved unto a life of works and obedience, recognizing the Lordship of Christ. And here in chapter 2, in verse 19, James indicates that for religious people, people who come to God's house and leave again, that our faith might be no better. In fact, it might be even worse than the very faith which devils and demons possess. Listen to what he says. He says, he makes this statement, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. There's almost a hint of sarcasm there whenever James utters these words. You believe that there's just one true and living God? Good for you. That's a good thing to believe. You're believing the right thing. But let me remind you, James says, that the demons believe the very same thing and they actually tremble. How many of us ever tremble whenever we think about the true and living God of the Bible? Last week we thought about dead faith. Faith without works is dead. This week we're considering demon faith. What the devils believe how it affects them, and ultimately what is lacking in their faith. A, E, I, O, and U are the five vowels. And each point this morning begins with one of the letters of our vowels. So first of all, the letter A. You'll notice in this text of Scripture, James 2, 19, that demon faith is an affecting faith. What the devils believe and what the demons believe actually, physically, affects them. It says there that the devils believe and tremble. It causes them to fear. Whenever the demons think and meditate upon who God is and what God is and what God requires, it actually causes them to shudder. It causes them to quake. It causes them to tremble. They believe, you see, folks, not in the God of their own imagination, not in the gods that the nations worship, not even in the God of modern evangelicalism, but the devils believe in the God of the Bible. 
And the result is that it causes them to tremble. Sometimes I wonder, as I look at faith today, I wonder what God do people really believe in today? We profess to believe in God. We profess to believe that God is holy. We profess to believe that God is righteous and God is just. We profess to believe that someday we will stand before God and give an account of the lives that we have lived on this earth. And yet all the while we can play with the world, we can flirt with sin, we can neglect the Bible, we can bunk off God's house. There's no responsibility to live for God, obey God, love God, walk with God. We don't even blink an eyelid, so to speak, whenever we think about the God of the Bible. And yet the scripture says that the very demons believe that there's the same true and living God that we profess to believe in, and they actually tremble. I know that oftentimes I talk a little bit about funeral services, and I really believe, as A.W. Tozer said, that the modern funeral needs a reformation. We can stand nowadays at an open graveside, and yet with a smile on our face talk about everything under the sun, apart from eternal realities. Even in the presence of death itself, we don't blink an eyelid whenever we think about our own eternal destinies and the great day of accountability. James says, Thou believest that there's one God, thou doest well. Good for you, that's a wonderful thing to believe. But he indicates, could it be, that the faith of demons is a faith that is closer to the Bible than our faith is. And yet all the while the devils are still damned. It's as if James is saying, you have got just enough religion to numb your senses, to think that all is well, whenever the reality is that for many church-going people, and I'm not pointing the finger at anyone here this morning, you have to search your own heart in this, but yet for many church-going people, the faith that we have is no better than the faith of demons. Demon faith is an affecting faith. Does your faith in God this morning affect the way that you live? Does it cause a reverence and a godly fear? Does it lead to a desire to obey and honor God? Does it lead to a holy respect for who God is? And for a very valid reference and uh, uh, respect for God's name. Demon faith is an affecting faith. Then the letter E, demon faith is an existent faith. Look at what it says in our text. The devil's also believe. Or just very simply, the devils believe. There's no demon that is an atheist or an agnostic. Every demon believes 100% in the existence of God. They don't believe in false gods. They don't believe in idols. They all believe in the one true and living God. The devils, plural, the demons, all of them believe. In God, their faith is real. Their faith exists. You don't need apologetics uh, to convince the devil that there's a God. He knows it full well. You don't have to convince demons of the folly of evolution or the folly of ecumenism or the folly of false religion. They know and they believe. And yet there are many church-going people today that question the reality of true faith in the Word of God. I remember one night in Lisburn, we were out in the doors and knocked this man's door and it turned out he was an elder in the Presbyterian church and we got talking about the word of God and talking about the gospel and talking about the need to be born again and, and the reality of sin and the reality is he denied it all. A man that had subscribed in writing to the Westminster Confession of Faith and he said this, do you really expect me to believe the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And he says, well, uh, if you're a professing Christian, and if you're an elder in a Reformed church, and if you've signed up to the Westminster Confession of Faith, of course I would expect you to believe, not just in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, but in all the chapters of the Bible, 
1166 books, both Testaments, of course, I would expect you to believe it. He says, it's an insult to my intelligence. And yet the Scripture says that the devils believe. And their faith is orthodox. Many church goers in Northern Ireland believe certain things. They lift out of the Bible what they will. And they believe certain things. Maybe this morning you say, well, I certainly don't have a problem believing the Bible. I believe it all from the first end in Genesis to the last amen in Revelation. I believe. The demons believe. But they tremble. Just because you believe does not indicate that you're genuinely saved. You know what's interesting as well? Whenever you study demons in Scripture, there are occasions whenever they received answers to prayer. We read in Mark chapter 5 and verse number 12 about this man who was possessed with over 200 or 2,000 rather demonic spirits and they entreated the Savior, they entreated Christ that they would be able to depart and enter into the herd of swine. And the Lord gave them what they asked for. They had answers to prayer. I remember one night in Limavady, of all places, we were out on the, the streets late one night, many, many years ago, standing outside a pub. And this man came out, he had a few drinks on him, he got talking, uh, and he told me that he believed in God, but he wasn't yet converted himself. Uh, and he told this story about his wife and he had had this little baby boy and he'd been very, very ill for months and months and months. And he says, he used to travel up and down to the hospital every day to see him. And all the while I was driving to the hospital and all the while I was coming home again, I was praying the whole time that God would preserve his life. I says, how's the wee boy doing now? He says, he's great. He's running about. He says, fit as a butcher's pup. Doing great. And I says, but you're not saved yourself. No, he says, not yet. And yet he could testify to God answering prayer in his life. Demons have also shown some level of obedience to the Lord. Every time that Christ cast out a devil, the devil responded and the devil had to obey. And the devil, the demon, did what it was told. Obedience to a certain degree on certain things and certain issues. And many today are partially obedient. But they'll not go all the way with God. Demon faith is an affecting faith. It's an existent faith. Then the letter I, it's an intelligent faith. Thou believest that there is one God. The devils also believe. James has been trying to show us that true, living, saving faith that results in a real, genuine relationship with God is much more than making a mental assent to certain truths. Sometimes we talk about other churches and denominations and things, and we talk about the so-called confirmation class in some of the Episcopal churches, and you know, you get the age of 14 or whatever it is, 15, and you sit there and you go through a list of questions and you say yes, yes, yes to all of these different truths and doctrines, and then you're received in as a member of the church. And yet in evangelical circles, we can almost be the same. And we've reduced faith to, do you believe in this, and do you believe in that, and do you believe the other? And if you believe all of those things, you're suddenly pronounced a Christian. And there's a danger with mere intellectualism. That you can convince somebody, yes, that maybe there's a God out there somewhere, and you need to get right with them. And if they can say yes to all of the right things, that's enough. I'm all on for what we call apologetics, presenting a case that there's a God. But friends, it's not enough. I remember a man that professed faith once in Christ, seemed to show evidence for a few weeks or months, and up until that point, he'd been a professing atheist. He said he didn't believe in God, or at the very least, he was an agnostic, wasn't sure if there was a God or not, and somebody had given him a lot of literature to read, all about evolution, and the folly of it, and he read it, and he became convinced that there was a God, and on the basis of that, he made a decision and professed to become a Christian. But it didn't last all that long. And there can be such a thing as an intellectual conversion. Convinced intellectually in your mind, whenever you weigh up all of the evidence, yes, there's a God, and if there's a God, I, I, I better you know, have some form of godliness intellectual conversion. And then there can be a mere emotional conversion. 
Somebody's emotions get stirred up in a meeting. They enjoy the singing and they enjoy the worship. It becomes almost hypnotic. They go with it for a while. They hear a few uh, entertaining stories and, uh, and the man at the front knows how to work the crowd and work the meeting and their emotions get stirred up and they make a profession of faith. Emotional conversions. And then there could be what we call volitional conversions. Somebody decides, maybe without understanding what the Bible teaches, maybe without undergoing conviction of sin or a desire to come to Christ, they make a mere decision. I will try this for a little while and see if it works. And you can even have all of those three things thrown in together. Intellectual, emotional, volitional conversions, but no spiritual conversion. I believe that the will and the intellect and the emotions need to be stirred up by the Spirit of God in bringing a person to Christ. We need to understand what the Bible teaches about ourselves and about God and about Christ and about salvation. We need to somehow be troubled about our sin and the emotions need to be affected. And yes, we need to make a choice and a rational commitment that we're going to follow Christ. But you can have all of that without really being born again. And the nature being changed. And the heart being changed. And without being really truly converted. But demon faith is merely intellectual. They believe everything that the Bible teaches about God. And that leads on to your third thought. That the letter O, demon faith, is an orthodox faith. It's an orthodox faith. While there is such a thing in the Bible, in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, about doctrines of devils. The devil himself, it appears to me at least, whenever we search the scriptures, that what he believes is entirely orthodox. It's what we might call a fundamentalist faith. I don't think the demons or the devil questions any of the doctrines of the Bible. I believe that he believes all of the fundamental truths of God's word. For example, the demons and the devil understands what the Bible teaches. So much so that he's able to quote it himself. Whenever Christ was being tempted of the devil for 40 days and for 40 nights, the devil came and was able to quote the scripture. He was able to say on several occasions, it is written. This is what the Bible says. The devil believes the Bible. And he can quote it better than any of us. And yet he's not right for heaven. You say, well, I believe the Bible as well. Well, that's good. You would need to. I don't believe a person to be a true Christian if they don't embrace the Bible and endorse the Bible and believe the Bible. And you say, well, I believe the Bible. The devil does too. And he trembles. He also believes that there's one true and living God. That's what our text says. Thou believest that there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. The devil is not a pantheist. He doesn't believe in a whole host of different gods. And Jehovah, and Jesus is just another one. He believes in one true and living God. You say, well, I just believe that there's one God. I don't believe in Allah. And I don't believe in Buddha. And I don't believe in this God or that God. I just believe in the God of the Bible. Thou doest well. But the devils also believe and tremble. I believe as well that the devil believes that this one true and living God is a triune God. The scripture says there are three that bear record in heaven. 1 John 5, 7, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And the scripture says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then God said, let us make man in our own image. The word God there, singular, then the word us, plural, indicating that there's one God revealed in three persons. And I believe that he made man, body, soul, and spirit, one man, but with three distinct parts to indicate something of the very nature of God. And then in Genesis 3, the serpent came and said to Adam and Eve, yea, hath God said. And it's interesting in Revelation 12 and 13 that there's a kind of unholy trinity. The devil will always try and ape something about God as he does with the trinity. There's the devil and there's the beast and there's the false prophet. 
the unholy trinity. He believes in the trinity. You say, well, I believe that too. Thou doest well. But the devils also believe and tremble. He also believes in the deity of Christ. We read in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, about the Lord going to the synagogue. And there he meets a man who's possessed with the devil. And the demon within that man says, as Jesus enters in the synagogue, I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And so it is with the demoniac here in the Gadarenes. The, the, the demon said to the Lord Jesus, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? They believe in the deity of Christ. And there are people today in evangelical circles and they'll say that that's not important. That doesn't matter. You don't really have to believe in the Trinity. You don't really have to believe in the deity of Christ. You don't really have to believe in the inspiration of Scripture. But friends, James says if you believe these things, you're doing well. You need to believe them. You say, well, I believe in the deity of Christ. The devils believe. And they tremble. He also believes in the atoning work of Christ. He believes in the power of the cross because the word of God says in Colossians 2, 15, that the Lord Jesus Christ destroyed principalities and powers, demonic spirits and forces, and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the work of his cross. He made a show of them openly on the cross by virtue of his shed blood. And by virtue of his glorious resurrection, he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And the devil knows more than anybody else just how victorious Jesus Christ was whenever he died upon that cross and shed his blood and cried out, it is finished. And he arose with the gates of death and hell and carries them to this moment in his very girdle. And the devil believes in the atoning work of Christ. And that's why he will do everything he can to divert our attention away from the blood. To divert our attention away from the cross. And people will get up and they'll preach every other thing, but they'll never really get to the cross. You say, well, I believe in the cross. Thou doest well. But the devils believe and tremble. The devils believe in the resurrection. In Acts chapter 19, verse number 15, we read about this uh, person who was demon-possessed and there were people trying to cast out the devils and they couldn't do it. And then the Lord Jesus arrived in the scene and the demon said these words, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? They believed that Jesus was alive. He wasn't there physically. But they didn't say, Jesus, I knew. They said, Jesus, we know. Now, the Lord Jesus had been on a cross. He died. He'd been buried. But they knew that wasn't the end. And they said to these seven sons of Sceva, we know who Jesus is. And we know who Paul is. Because they were alive and well. They believe that Jesus Christ is alive. You say, well, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and I believe he rose again and I believe he's ascended into heaven. Now do us well. The devils believe and tremble. Demons also believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. For Satan himself has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He knoweth his time is short. Why? Because he knows that Jesus Christ is coming back again. He knows that Jesus Christ rules and reigns in glory. He knows that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And he knows that Jesus Christ is coming back again visibly, personally, gloriously, and even suddenly. He doesn't know when he's coming back, but he knows that he is coming back. And in light of that, he trembles. When was the last time you thought about the return of Jesus Christ? Coming gloriously, visibly, personally, and suddenly. You say, well, I believe in it. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. 
One last thing that I want to share with you. The devils also believe in a literal hell. Scripture says in Matthew 25, 41, that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. And he knows his time is short. He knows exactly where he's going. And no wonder the demons tremble and they quake and they quiver and they shudder whenever they think about the holiness of God and they think about where their destiny is going to be and they literally tremble. They do more than many professing Christians do. Many professing Christians, we say we believe that there's a hell, but we would never pray for a loved one. We would never come to a prayer meeting. We would never seek the Lord. We wouldn't endeavor to invite somebody out under the sound of the gospel. The demons believe that there's a hell and they tremble. They, they're troubled about it. And you're maybe here this morning and you're not saved. And if I was to ask you, you'd say, I'm not saved. Well, where are you going to be in eternity? And if you're honest, you might say, well, I suppose if the Bible's true, I'm going to be in hell. But you don't tremble. It doesn't seem to unsettle you. It certainly doesn't shake you out of your sin. But you say, I believe it. Well, the devils also believe and they tremble. Demon faith is an affecting faith. It's an existent faith. It's an intellectual faith. It's an orthodox faith. And you say, well, where's the problem? Well, very simple. Letter U. Demon faith is an unfruitful faith. Doesn't lead to a life of holiness. Doesn't lead to a love for Christ. Doesn't lead to any types of, of works of charity or works of service. And you can believe it all from A to Z and tick every box and yet be absolutely no fruit for your profession. And folks, these are solemn things. You say, well, what's the problem? Well, demon faith, there's no fruitfulness. Matthew 7 and verse 20 and 17, the Lord says, By their fruit ye shall know them. No fruit of salvation. No salvation brings fruit. You should be able to tell whenever a person's really saved. Whenever John the Baptist was baptizing people in the River Jordan and the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests come down, he says, well, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And they were just jumping in the bandwagon. Everybody else was going along with us. And then John said to them, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. If you're really turning from your sin and you're giving your lives to God and, and you're, you're repenting, he says, let's see the fruit. Are you willing to leave your sin? Are you willing to live a life of holiness? Are you willing to go through with God? Are you willing to show me that you're really sincere and that you're really genuine? Fruits of salvation. Then there's the fruit of the Spirit that's cultivated not by the works of the flesh, but by the Spirit of God in a person. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith, meekness and temperance. Those are just like the fruits on a tree. If a tree's rooted in the ground and the soil's right and it's getting nourishment and it's getting water and it's getting sunshine, the tree will grow, it'll produce leaves. And if it's an apple tree, it'll produce apples. If it's a fig tree, it'll produce figs. If it's a pear tree, it'll produce pears. Whatever fruit it's supposed to produce, it'll produce. It just happens. And whenever a person's rooted and grounded in grace and in the Savior's love, and they're living in the sunshine of God's grace, and they're being fed with the water and the milk and the meat of God's Word, there should be some type of fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. And then the fruit of sanctification. God says in His Word through the Apostle Paul, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Sanctification is a process, dying more and more and more unto sin, living more and more and more unto righteousness. Peter talked about growing in grace. And what James is telling us here is that whenever a person really believes and has trusted Christ, and it's more than just a head knowledge, it's a hard experience, he says there'll be growth, there'll be development. They'll, they'll grow to love things that they never loved before. They'll grow to hate things that they loved before. And there'll be the fruit of salvation, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of sanctification, and also the fruit of service. God says to each and every one of us, Son, go work today in my vineyard. 
And God mightn't call you to be an evangelist or a preacher or a missionary or a door-to-door worker or a Sunday school teacher, but there's plenty of work to be done in God's vineyard. It might be the work of prayer. It might be the work of being an encourager. It might be the work of something very, very practical. It just might be just to be there in your place and to serve and honor God faithfully and to encourage God's people and to lift burdens and to speak a word in season to them that are weary and just by your life to serve the Lord in the workplace, in the home, in the community, wherever it is, the fruit of service. Demon faith has got no fruitfulness. Why has it got no fruitfulness? Because it has got no faithfulness. There's a world of a difference between faith and faithfulness. True saving faith in God will I always believe ultimately lead to true faithfulness to God. Faith in God ought to lead to faithfulness to God. The demons believe. They have got a kind of faith. But it does not lead to faithfulness to God. You say, what do you mean by faithfulness to God? How does that manifest itself? Well, if we're going to be faithful to God, we would want to be faithful to God's word. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then there would also be faithfulness to God's work. Son, go work today in my vineyard. James has been saying it to us several occasions. Faith without works is dead. Faithfulness to God's house. Being like Anna there in Scripture. Whenever the house of God was open, she was an old woman of 84 years, a widow of 84 years, and she was in God's house day and night. Faithfulness to God's house. Faithfulness to God's people. Faithfulness to God's table. Faithfulness to God's day. Faithfulness to God's cause. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. We all need today to make sure that we've got reality. Not just a head knowledge, but a heart experience and a life that testifies to what we profess to believe. May God save us from dead faith. May God save us from demon faith. May we have a faith that is real and vibrant that leads to a love for and a devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe today you've never really trusted Christ. You've never really cast the weight of your sin and your soul upon him. You've never said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, take my sin. Lord, forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross and I want to live a life that glorifies you. But Lord, I can't do that myself. I need the Spirit of God. Lord, would you just save me and help me to live for you? Have you ever done that? Have you ever cast yourself upon the mercy of God? Really trusted Jesus Christ? And if you have, is it really evidenced in our lives today before a perishing world? May God give us that which is real and that which is genuine. We're going to sing together a closing hymn.